Well, since I'm up here, uh, that's an indication Pastor Harris is away. Uh, he and MJ are celebrating their 50th wedding anniversary. And uh, as someone who's uh, approaching their 50th wedding anniversary, it, uh, it demonstrates an extreme perseverance. And if you don't believe that, ask my wife. <laughs> <laughs> so today, in place of Pastor Harris, we're, we're blessed to have John Carroll again to, uh, to teach the word of the Lord. So please pay attention because this is the word of the Lord. John. Well, good morning, everyone. Good to see everybody's made it out through, I guess, now tropical storm Henri. So uh, we'll get through the rains and everything, and I, we'll, we'll be fine. We'll be fine, I'm sure. If you would open up your Bibles to uh, John chapter 3, Gospel of John chapter 3, uh, we'll be looking at God's Word there this morning. And before we begin, let me just read the passage. Verse 1 says, Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the mir miraculous signs you are doing if God were not with him. In reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth. No one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. How can a man be born when he is old? Nicodemus asked. Surely he and I cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth. No one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. Let's pray as we begin. Our Heavenly Father, we uh, open up your word. We see these words of Jesus, this interaction of Jesus with Nicodemus, and we we just pray that uh, your spirit would guide us as to what uh, all of this means for us. We just ask this in his wonderful name. Amen. My wife Grace and I are what you would call movie buffs. We mostly watch the older films and some we can just watch over and over again and not get tired of it. It's, it's like visiting old friends. That's the way that we look at it. Now, if you ask Grace, she will tell you that her, one of her all-time favorites is that Frank Capra film, it's a Wonderful Life. Can, can we have a little shot? There we go. That's, that's what it looks like. Uh, one of the, a clip from that. How many of you have seen It's a Wonderful Life? Oh, just about everybody has seen It's a Wonderful Life. If you haven't seen it, it'll probably be on next to, close to Christmas in, in just a couple of months. But most of you will remember how Jimmy Stewart runs into some financial difficulties and he's about to kill himself when his guardian angel steps in and interrupts his plan. You can see him there with the, with the snow on. Not yet, not yet. Not <laughs> hold on, hold on. Sorry. Whoops. Um, he tells the angel that he wishes he had never been born, and the angel grants him that wish and shows him how bad things were for his loved ones and for the entire town because he was not there. And I have to agree with Grace, that is a great movie. That is a great movie. But I have a favorite too. I think you got a little preview there already. <laughs> it may or may not surprise you, but my favorite film is... There it is, Captain America, the first Avenger. How many have seen that one? Oh, okay, good, yeah, good. Um, it's the story of Steve Rogers, who wants to fight in World War II, but he's too small and he has a host of conditions that get him classified as 4F. But then a scientist observes him, really wanting to get into the army. Um, and so he pulls some strings and gets him in. Now in basic training, he can't do as many push-ups as the other guys. He's the slowest at running the mile. And he's dead last on the obstacle course. But he has the heart of a hero. He has the heart of a hero. And the scientist seeing this in him then injects him with a serum and exposes him to gamma radiation, which transforms into a, into a bigger, faster, stronger man. And with those power, he, he goes off to battle an evil group of Nazis called Hydra. I won't give away the rest of the plot. I won't give it away. But why am I talking about all this? What do those two movies have to do with John chapter 3, this passage we just read? Well, both of those movies and John 3 are about transformations transformations. An angel is sent to encounter George Bailey, Jimmy Stewart, and his life is changed. If God did not send the angel, there would be no movie because the main character would be dead. 
with Captain America unless something outside of him over which he had no control came into his life, he would not have become a superhero. Both of those characters, we could say, were born again. Not in the way the Bible uses the term, but they kind of serve as an illustration of John chapter 3. Let's take a look at what being born again is for those of us who are not characters in a movie. We begin with a man who really is in need of rebirth, and his name is Nicodemus. Look at verse 1. It says, now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council. Sometime around the year 1227, the Bible was divided into chapters and verses. It took us that long to get to that point. Now, although that system is very helpful in locating any passage very quickly, uh, unless you're looking for Obadiah or Haggai, sometimes those markers can get in the way of our understanding. And our text today is a case in point. So we need to back up a little bit into chapter 2. Otherwise, we may get off on the wrong foot as, as we consider this man Nicodemus. Now, if we just take chapter 3 by itself, we would look at this verse, verse 1. We observe that he's a Pharisee. And then we recall that the Pharisees were sort of the enemies of Jesus. And then we start to think the worst of him. So we may erroneously ascribe nefarious motives for his visit with Jesus. But when we ignore that chapter break and look at it with chapter 2, verse 25, then we arrive at a different, pre- different impression of old Nicodemus. Let's read it again with a new perspective. We'll put that up on the screen here. Jesus did not need man's testimony about man, for he knew what was in a man. But, and I think but is a better translation here than now, but there was a man of the Pharisees. What's the difference? What's the difference? Well, Jesus knows what's in the hearts of people. That's what verse 25 tells us. And the implication is that what's in our hearts is not too good, is not too good. Anybody here want what you've been thinking about lately displayed on the screen up here? Yeah, I didn't think so. It's not just the shadow who knows what evil lurks in the hearts of men. Jesus knows infinitely better. If you have no idea who the shadow is after the service, you can ask somebody to listen to the old-time radio shows way back when, and, and they'll tell you what the shadow is. So Jesus knows what's in a person, and it's not good. It's not good. But, implying a contrast, there was a man of the Pharisees. So here's somebody that's different from the crowd. If we go back in verse 24 of chapter 2, it says that Jesus did not entrust himself to the crowd. But he will reveal something to Nicodemus, this Pharisee. (coughs) So what about these Pharisees? Well, let's look at a few facts which give us some background on Nicodemus. I think we have a a slide here for that too. (coughs) Excuse me. The Pharisees as a group began began around 145 BC, and they were basically middle-class tradesmen who were concerned about keeping the law of Moses, but more important to them was their oral traditions. That's what Jesus was always fighting with them for, those oral traditions. Now at that time in Israel, there were about 6,000 Pharisees. In order to become a Pharisee, there was a probationary period of of one month to a year, I guess, depending on who was the one that's leading you through this. Um, Now, during that time, this man was observed very carefully about how meticulously he kept the law and those traditions. Now, the Pharisees, they did believe in angels. They did believe in the resurrection of the dead. And they did believe in a Messiah who was to come and to put things right, which their counterpart, the the Sadducees, had corrupted. Okay? So that's what makes them different from them. John also informs us that Nicodemus was a member of the Jewish ruling council, or Sanhedrin. Now, there were only 71 men on this council, so Nicodemus was a rather important fellow. So putting all this together, we discern that Nicodemus is a devout Jew with a high position in society. Now, back in chapter 2, we had seen Jesus clear out the temple of the money changers and those that were selling animals in the temple courts. Now, since, Jesus, or since Nicodemus believed that the Messiah was coming and may have done something like what Jesus did, perhaps he began to wonder whether it was possible that Jesus could be the Messiah, especially since he was doing some miracles too. Well, the best way to find out is to go and ask him some questions. Which brings us to verse 2. 
He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the miraculous signs you are doing if God were not with him. Now, you may have heard someone expounding upon Nicodemus and criticizing him for coming to Jesus at night. And they judged the poor man to be cowardly, fearing that the other Pharisees will excoriate him or maybe other people of the society. And, and so he comes to Jesus under the cover of darkness. We'll talk about jumping to conclusions. Talk about jumping to conclusions. Other than the coming at night, there's nothing in the passage which indicates that he had a yellow streak in him. There could be any number of reasons why he came at night. And here's one possibility. Note how he says, we know, we know. That could be an indication that he was sent by the Jewish ruling council. And since the Bible doesn't really condemn him, let's not do so either, okay? Just simply view him as a man who has a question or two. Jesus did have a tendency to draw crowds. And so nighttime would be the ideal time to converse with Jesus without someone interrupting with a request to be healed of any number of possible diseases. At night, he could have an extended discussion with Jesus over theological matters. Now, Nicodemus begins by addressing Jesus as rabbi, which is the Hebrew word for teacher. It's a term of respect. He's being very respectful as he comes. He's coming with the right attitude. Now, it's interesting how the Greek text reads. Let's put that up on the screen there, too. It says, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God, a teacher. So it, it begins with the Hebrew word for teacher, and the clause ends with the Greek word for teacher. Now, Nicodemus grants that Jesus is a teacher, but he's not quite ready to call him prophet, much less king or even Messiah. But yet he does acknowledge that Jesus is able to do miracles. And this is maybe where his dilemma lies and uh, why he's come to Jesus. He knows God is working through him. But in his mind, Jesus can't be no more than a teacher. And this is the dilemma that many folks have as well. They accept Jesus as a good teacher. And perhaps he did, he did some miracles. But to call him their king, their Messiah, their redeemer, well, that's just not a step that they're ready to take. But Jesus lays out very clearly what each and every one of us must do in the next verse, verse 3. In reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. Well, we read Jesus' response to Nicodemus and we wonder if we perhaps nod it off for a minute or two since the conversation that just doesn't seem to flow. What Jesus said appears to be what is known as a non sequitur a remark that has no bearing on what was just said. One would expect that after the nice words and the compliment that Nicodemus paid Jesus, that he would respond with something like, well, thank you very much, or yes, you are correct, God is with me. Now, is there something you wanted to talk about? But Jesus cuts right to the chase and turns the conversation to the need that Nicodemus and all of us have, the need to be born again. Now, we've all become familiar with that phrase, born again. It's even been co-opted and really corrupted by the world. For example, you look on the internet and you can read an article in the business area about born again uh, global firms. And that's really interesting stuff, isn't it? Or if you're looking at the sports area or something about that, a ball player who, after a slump or an injury, will, feel like he, will say, like, I feel like I've been born again. I'm playing so much better. Look again, and you will find born-again hair treatment. Not sure exactly what that is. I didn't <laughs> go into it very much. But it must be something great because it's born-again hair treatment. Okay? But none of those are close to what Jesus meant by being born again. And he was the one that originated the phrase. But let's put ourselves back in Nicodemus' sandals for a moment. We don't really know what he wanted to ask Jesus or talk to him about. All he did was make an introductory mark, and then Jesus takes him in a direction that he did not expect to go. It becomes an unexpected lesson from a great teacher. And in that one sentence which Jesus spoke, there's quite a bit to consider, quite a bit to consider. He begins with the words, I tell you the truth. In other words, what you are about to hear is a true statement. I assure you that it is true. 
or I'm, assert, I'm asserting that these words are 100% accurate. And those words are, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. Now, by the word see, Jesus does not mean simply perceive with the eyes. We should understand it as, as this word. Let me put that up on the screen. You understand see as experience. No one can experience the kingdom of God unless born again. People who are not born again can certainly see the kingdom, but they can't experience it. They cannot know what it's all about. And that brings us to the next point, which is, what is the kingdom of God? Well, the kingdom of God is the Lord's will being done on earth as it is in heaven. That sound a little familiar? It probably does. The kingdom is actually his people, so you're not going to find it on a map. But it's also more than just people. It's people doing his will, living according to the Bible, demonstrating to others the love which he has not just for them, but for the world as well. If only they'd accept it. If only they'd accept it. So that's the kingdom as we see it now. In the future, the kingdom of God is going to be a little bit different. It will be pure. There will be no one to oppose it. And all of its citizens will be the nicest people on earth with never an unkind word or a nasty deed. That's what the kingdom will be. And just how does one become a part of this kingdom? Well, as Jesus says, one has to be born again. Now, in most of our translations, there's a footnote for the word again. And the footnotes will tell us that the phrase could be translated as born from above. So which is it? Is it born again or born from above? Well, if you look up the Greek word in the lexicon, you're going to find this. Let's take a look at that. It will define as purposely ambiguous and means both born from above and born again. Purposely ambiguous and means both born from above and born again. So was Jesus trying to confuse Nicodemus? As we talked about the last time he was here, was he obfuscating? Was he obf no, not really. No, not really. Nicodemus certainly understood Jesus to mean again, because that's what elicited his questions in the next verse. But Jesus really did mean that one has to be born again, that is a second time, and this birth can only come from above. Jesus will clarify that in verses 5 and 6, and so we'll expand on a little bit more then. But before we get there, there are two key words that we have to consider. Those words are unless and cannot. Unless and cannot. Now, the King James Version translates, or the New King James, translates Jesus' words this way. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So what is Jesus saying here? One desirable thing is predicated on another. This does not happen unless this first occurs. It's like when a parent tells a child, unless you clean up your room... You're not going to be allowed to go outside and play. Now, that may not be the best illustration since parents have become a little bit more permissive over these last decades, and the child is more than happy to stay inside and play computer games. So let me change it up a little bit, change that illustration a bit, and let's imagine a man has come to do some, some work on your home, maybe some renovations, something like that. What he is going to say is, probably not as blunt as this, but what it all boils down to is, Unless you pay me this amount of money up front, I'm not going to start on the job. And that's that. The work on your house is predicated on you giving the man some cash. And it's the same with entering the kingdom of God. Your admission to that kingdom is predicated on being born again. The one is not going to happen without the other. Being born again is essential. The other key word Jesus uses is cannot which could be translated as not able. There's a finality in those words. There's no wiggle room, okay? There's no loophole. There's no possibility of change. This is serious business. We're talking about eternity. We're talking about your eternity. On the other hand, if you've been born again, <clears throat> the kingdom is a certainty, a present reality, and a joy in your life. So what does Nicodemus think of all that Jesus has said here? Let's look at verse 4. How can a man be born when he is old, Nicodemus asked. 
Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born, can he? Now, before we look at Nicodemus' questions, we, we should applaud him. Not literally. Don't, don't need to do that now. Many people, after hearing Jesus' statement there, would just blurt out, that's absurd. What nonsense. I, I'm out of here. I'm out of here. You may have countered such a reaction to, your, to, uh, to Jesus yourself. You know, I don't get that born again business. All you have to do is try your best and, and you'll be all right with the big man upstairs. But Jesus assured us, and it's absolutely true, that unless you are born again, you will not be a part of the kingdom of God. Heaven will not be a part of your future if you're not born again. That's the final word. No argument, no discussion, no way around it. But our good friend Nicodemus hangs in there. He knows that Jesus is a teacher who has come from God. And when God spoke in the Old Testament, some of the things were, were not too easy to understand. You read through the Old Testament, you do, well, what does this mean? I said, not too easy. Therefore, he was going to sit there and try and figure out what Jesus said. And so he asked a couple of questions. Let's look at the first one. How can a man be born when he is old? Now, this Greek word for old is where we get words like gerontology and geriatrics, and even geritol. If you have no idea what those words mean, then you must still be a youngster. Count yourself happy. If you're all too familiar with those words, God bless you. God bless you. Now, Nicodemus was probably long in the tooth himself since the word old refers to someone who was 60 to 80 years old. So he's probably wondering how he could become a part of the kingdom of God since he's, thinking, he's figuring he's beyond that age which would qualify him. You know, okay, that, I, I, I can't get that. It's, it's, it's just beyond. It, I, I, I must be too old. We could have a lot of fun with the, with the second remark that he makes. In our society today, sociologists are now describing the boomerang generation. The boomerang generation. These are people ages 24 to 34 who left home and then returned to live with their parents once again. It, it happens to be a sizable number of kids the parents allow to return back to the nest. But the amount of mothers who would allow a child to return to the womb is zero, okay? It's zero. It's not only a question of lack of room, but if Nicodemus is in that 60 to 80 year range, his mom may not be around, to put it nicely. So that's double trouble for him to become a part of God's kingdom. But Jesus is not going to leave him twisting in the wind. Let's look at verses 5 and 6. <coughs> Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. So Jesus begins by repeating what he first said to Nicodemus. I tell you the truth, or truly, truly, I assure you. In other words, what Jesus is about to tell him is the absolute truth. Then Jesus again refers to the kingdom of God, but adds something else which is very intriguing. Something else for Nicodemus to ruminate on. Okay? In order to enter the kingdom of God, one must be born of water and the spirit. Oh, by the way, it's not just Nicodemus, but Bible scholars since Jesus spoke those words have been chewing on it. Okay? And there are at least seven different views as to what Jesus meant. We're not going to examine them all. I think somebody from the back is starting to sing the doxology again. Oh, praise God for womb blessing. <laughs> now, um, instead, let me just give you what I believe Jesus meant. If you like some other view, we can, we can hash it out after the service. Be glad to do that. But basically, Jesus is talking about physical birth and spiritual birth. Water would refer to physical birth. Even today, when a woman is giving birth, both mom and medical professionals speak of her water breaking. And so a baby is born, as the Greek text literally reads, out of water. Born out of water. Okay? Um, so this is a great way of describing natural birth. Now those who would hold to a different view question, well, why would Jesus talk about natural birth here? After all, isn't it obvious that one has to be born first in order to be part of the kingdom of heaven? Well, there are three reasons for Jesus bringing up natural birth. For the first reason, we need to go back to that double meaning of the word again, which could also mean from above. Nicodemus understood Jesus to mean again, and so he questions him about climbing back into his mother's womb. Okay, so that, okay, yeah, that's, that would be the womb thing there. 
Secondly, in verse 6, Jesus declares, flesh gives birth to flesh, but spirit gives birth to spirit. So Jesus is actually expanding on born of water and the spirit, flesh and spirit. So he's explaining what that means. The third reason is that in verses 3, 5, 6, 7, and 8, we find either the words born or gives birth. So how can we not help but think about a natural birth? So just like in his parables where Jesus uses earthly things as illustrations of spiritual things, like when he talked about planting seeds and harvesting crops, so here also he talks about natural birth as an illustration of something that is spiritual. Well, what is there about birth, natural birth, in which we can see a, a spiritual comparison? Well, when you're born again, it means a new life, a completely new life. It means a big transformation. Growth occurs as we learn to speak a different way. When we're born again, we encourage instead of insult. We speak lovingly of Jesus instead of using his name as a curse word. I could go on. You, you, get, you get the idea there. The Bible also refers to our life as a walk. Now, when you're really, really, really young, you learn how to toddle, okay? And eventually, you become a little bit more uh, firm in your mobility. And this could be likened to our, our growth, which occurs as we learn more about Jesus and imitate him, as we walk in his footsteps, so to speak. So being born again is a radically different way of life. All right, <clears throat> here's the most important part about all this. This is the critical point Jesus is making that many people disregard. Just because you are born does not mean that you will automatically go to heaven when you die. If you're born in the United States, you can attend the local school for free up to the 12th grade. No question about it, you're in. But that does not mean that after that you'll automatically get into an Ivy League college. Okay? Nor could you just show up at West Point and say, I'm here, you have to accept me as a student since I was born in the USA. That's not going to happen. That's not how one gets into the military academy. But somebody could get there and argue, well, I'm young and in my prime. Let me in. Sorry. I, I'm well educated. I've memorized 500 books on military strategy. Sorry. I've got a black belt in martial arts. Sorry. Hey, man, I worked out. You know, like I got 24-inch biceps. Just look at these monsters. Sorry. Okay. I'm a man. Sorry. I'm a woman. Sorry. I'm white. I'm black. I'm Hispanic. I'm Asian. I'm Native American. Sorry. It doesn't matter who you are or what you've done. It's their call on your, your matriculation. And it's the same with God. It's his call on getting into heaven. Your gender is not the deciding issue, nor is your skin color or level of education. It doesn't matter how often uh, or which church you attend. Denominations are all man-made institutions. The Lord hasn't really sanctioned any one of them. And let me give you one more thing that really isn't a secret, but people just don't seem to get it. The amount of good deeds that you do is not a deciding factor for entry into heaven. Look what Jesus said here. Put that up on the screen. <clears throat> he said, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Okay? So, if, if, well, I'm a righteous person. I've done more good than bad. That's, he's not calling you. That's, it, that's, not, that's not your call to heaven. He's talking about sinners. That's who he wants. Sinners who will accept him and change their life. And it doesn't mean by that that we can sin our way into heaven. Our passage informs us that the only ticket into heaven is to be born again. But here's another key component that we cannot pass up. We looked at being born of water. Now we have to consider what it means to be born of the Spirit. Uh, you want the theological term for that? It's called regeneration. Regeneration. Well, if we break that word down, regeneration, we know that the has this prefix re, R-E, which means again. A rerun on TV is a show that's been on the air before and they've just broadcast it again. To generate something is to give it birth. So regeneration simply means being born again. And as Jesus indicates here, it is a work of the Holy Spirit. Well, how does the Holy Spirit give us new birth? That is, change us, making us a new creation. 
That's a mystery. That's a mystery. We don't know how the Spirit does it, but we do see changes in our lives once we accept Jesus. We no longer do those things we did before because the Holy Spirit tells us that God is not really pleased with that behavior. Okay, Lord, I'll be glad to change it. We find that there's peace and there's joy in our hearts because we've been forgiven of all of our sins through Jesus' death and resurrection. The Lord gives us a completely new outlook on life. There's love in our hearts for other people. It's the love of God. And he wants us to share that love with others, which then advances the kingdom of heaven. And so now we have a new purpose in life as well. So what have we learned today? Jesus tells us that without a doubt, everyone who has been born needs to be born again, born from above, born by the Holy Spirit. And so I ask, have you been born again? Have you been born again? You have a part in it. As we've learned, it's not just by doing good works, trying to be a good person. The Bible tells us what to do in verses 14 through 16 in this chapter. Jesus said, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. He was lifted up on the cross. That everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Believe in Jesus. Put your trust in him that he can wipe out all of your sins. And when you do that, he will send, set you walking beside him through the rest of your life. Let's pray. There may be somebody listening that has heard these words and that understands that they, they need to have this new life. They need to be born again. And so if you're, if you're in that position right now, all you need to do is just say a simple prayer to Jesus. Lord, I know I've been a sinner. And Lord, I, I know I need new birth. My life is a mess. It's not what it should be. And so I come to you, and Lord, I just pray that you would take away my sin through Jesus. Lord, make me that person that you want me to be, because I want to spend forever with you. And I just pray this in Jesus' name. And Lord, we just pray this morning that these words would go out and, and touch people's lives. Lord, that you would change us to, to the people that we need to be, being better people for your kingdom. We ask this in his wonderful name. Amen. Wow, another sermon by John Carroll. That was great. He talks about Nicodemus and his inter interaction with Jesus. Remember that... Uh, to be born again is a gift from God. It's the greatest gift ever given and the greatest gift you can ever receive. And there's no way you can purchase this gift. This is something that, that, that God gives, gives to you. So when you hear that voice in your heart that says, uh, come to me, don't let your heart be hardened, but follow that voice and come to God. Lord, we thank you for being with us today. Lord, we, we thank you for the words that, that John Carroll has, has brought to us, and we pray, Lord, that we'll take them to our hearts, Lord, that we will come to you, Lord, in, in humility and, and in love and with a, 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 a vow for obedience, Lord, to, to do the things that you ask us to do, Lord. And for the love you have given us, Lord, we thank you in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, you may be seated. Would you please wait, uh, stay for the after the service?